guest today is Steve Schwartz of the LSAT blog and the LSAT Unplugged podcast and YouTube channels. And we're going to link to them from the show notes at exhibit.com slash 415. Now, Steve graduated from Columbia University in 2008. In high school and college, he tutored students in a variety of subjects and also helped press prep test takers for standardized tests, including the LSAT. However, he really began to focus on the LSAT when he was applying to law school. He founded the LSAT blog in 2008 and never looked back. Today, 13 years later, he has helped thousands master the LSAT, get into law school, and sometimes secure scholarships worth tens of thousands of dollars. Steve, welcome back to Admissions Straight Talk. Thanks so much for having me back on, Linda. Great to see you again. Great to have you. Now, we spoke almost exactly one year ago when the Flex LSAT was new, Corona was new. At the time, we discussed the new and remote Flex LSAT. Today, we're going to discuss the demise of the Flex LSAT. What gives? I mean, basically, the Flex was always kind of meant to be temporary, and I think that's why LSAC gave it the Flex name to distinguish it from the normal, regular LSAT. But here we are, one year later. COVID-19 is unfortunately still with us to some extent, although hopefully things will be looking better later this year with the vaccine rollouts and such. But LSAC, they, they can't keep administering the LSAT without experimental sections. They've got to be able to test out future questions. So starting in August this year, they're adding back in an experimental section, and they're going to start calling it just the LSAT again. Got it. And how is the LSAT going to be different from the LSAT, L, Flex LSAT, given that they are both remotely proctored exam, exams? I should say. Sure. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a very, very small difference. I don't want people to get overly stressed about it. It's still the same question types, the same difficulty levels. So you're going to have logic games, logical reasoning, reading comprehension like before. It'll still be the same length of 35 minutes per section but the overall test sitting will be longer by adding back in that fourth unscored experimental section. They'll also insert a break between the second and third sections. So the length gets a little bit longer, maybe 10 minute break plus another 35 minutes for that fourth section. So test takers are looking at roughly a 45 minute longer exam, but as you said, it'll still be online. And entirely online. Are there any in-person testing centers planned for those who prefer that? Not currently. At the moment, okay. I don't think that we'll see any for quite a while, but LSAC indicates that they're open to the possibility, although they still will keep the online option we're expecting. And they've said it'll be online through at least June 2022. But this is still much shorter than the pre-COVID LSAT, which had five sections, four scored, one unscored experimental. Now the LSAT for the foreseeable future will have three scored sections plus one unscored experimental section. Got it. It's very interesting from my perspective. GMAC with the GMAT, you have an option to take it in person or remotely. MCAT is entirely, the medical uh, aptitude test is entirely in person. There's no remote possibility. Uh, I think GRE has both, but I'd have to look. And, and the LSAC is entirely re remote. So it's it's like each one has, has a different approach. Yeah, I mean, there's so many logistical things for them to deal with that oh, yeah. I can understand. I mean, on the one hand, I think it's nice to give people options. On the other hand, it's a lot of work to offer in multiple contexts. And in person, the logistics of doing it that way, booking the testing centers, especially when the LSAT, unlike some of the others, I mean, if I understand correctly, the GRE is virtually every day. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, so the LSAT's not even every month. It's almost every month. So right. they don't have that same level of regularity. It's like things are kind of ad hoc for each time they're doing it. I think there are also many more GRE test takers. Yes. So just yes. Kind of so many more subjects, but yeah. Yeah, yeah the economy no, is scale. Uh, <laughs> but it's, but the, again, the looking, you know, stepping back and looking at the landscape overall, it's kind of interesting how each one has chosen a different path. Yeah, confusing for people who want dual degrees, right? Right, that's for sure. That's for sure. Go for the GRE. Um, mm -hmm. Now, will applicants know which section is experimental? So that's the thing. I'm glad you raised that question. They will not know during the exam. They will not know whether that unscored extra section is going to be games, reasoning, or reading comp. And they also don't know 
where in the exam it'll be. So it could be your first section, you're doing it, and it's unscored. It could be the last section, in which case at least you've already gotten through the stuff that mattered to you. Or it could right. be somewhere in the middle. And they don't tell you which section it's going to be because if they did, you probably wouldn't try as hard. And then that would affect the, their ability Literally. to benefit from the results of what you're doing. They want to be yeah. able to see how you perform. So every test will have four different sections and just one of the sections will be unscored. That's right. So there's going to be three types of sections, but one of them you're going to get twice. So at well, the then end you'll of know the that one of those two is, is the test. Exactly. So after all said and done, you're going to know, okay, well, if I had two logic game sections, one of those was the fake one. You're just not going to know which one it is. But let's say you do logic game section one, logic game section two. Well, then you know the reading comp and logical reasoning is going to be real. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. So at least you have that information. Good or bad, you have it. At least you've and, got it. <laughs> of course, and of course, as you're going through, until you get the second section, you're not going to... Right, right, right. Yeah, so you basically, unfortunately, you've got to try on everything. Of course, right. Um, do you recommend that applicants take the Flex LSAT? In other words, they make sure they get it done before we move to the LSAT, before August, and as soon as possible, essentially? Or should they wait for the traditional LSAT? That's a great question. I mean, all else being equal, I think anybody would prefer to do it without the experimental section and be done by June. But right. I would not recommend that you rush it if you're not fully ready by June. Of course. And that additional two That's months nice. could make a big difference. Yeah. Yeah. As, as with almost anything in, in admissions, I mean, one of the things I always tell applicants is I'll ask, when should I apply? I'll say apply as early as possible, provided you don't compromise the quality of your application and the same as with the test taking experience. Yes, that is an enormous caveat that everyone should pay close attention to in all of these contexts, right? I mean, mm -hmm. doing it earlier, getting it done sooner. I think all people just want to be done with this stuff and get on to the actual grad school they're applying to, right? <laughs> the law school they're applying to. This is just a means to an end. But these things are incredibly important. Your LSAT score mm -hmm. matters a great deal. And so, don't rush to get it done by June just to do the three-section version when an extra two months could make an enormous difference in getting a higher LSAT score, getting more scholarship money, getting into better schools. And that June versus August thing, the August LSAT's in mid-August. You get your results back at the end of August, you can still apply at the beginning of the cycle either way. Right, right. And you'll apply knowledgeably, knowing, knowing what your LSAT score is as opposed to just kind of applying in, in the dark. Exactly. Right. Um, how should applicants adjust their prep in light of the additional section and increased length of the LSAT versus the LSAT flex if they're not ready to take it by July? I would say just practice like it's going to be on game day. So do four section practice test sittings, splice in an unscored extra section from another exam, or I'll, and place that extra section in any position, first, second, third, or fourth. It's kind of funny, actually, but the released prep tests from the past are all four section exams because the exam used to be four scored sections plus that fifth unscored experimental section. So if you want to insert logical reasoning as your extra section for the new LSAT starting in August 2021, you've already got it built in with all of the previously released exams. There's mm -hmm. nearly a hundred like that, but you don't want to only use logical reasoning as your extra section. So you should also make some little Frankenstein exams inserting logic game sections from other prep tests or reading comp sections from other prep tests. But you do that, you'll be ready. Great tip. Great tip. Now, LSAC indicated it may need to adjust the core release date, the score release date, rather, um, given anticipated higher volume for the August administration specifically, probably because you will have the score before you actually can start applying. Now, how much longer do you think it will take to get the score if you take the August test? I would say you'll probably get it within three weeks. It used to be a three-week wait to get your score back. With three weeks the of, the, of the test date. Yeah, so three weeks since you took it, or three weeks mm -hmm. of that testing period. So three weeks, it used to be, three, used to be of course, pre-flex. It was on a single day. It wasn't like you had a whole week of flex administrations like we have now with the online LSAT. So mm -hmm. you get it about three weeks later, and they wouldn't even be precise about the date. They would have an estimated release date, but then release it randomly early. So everybody was super stressed about whenever it would come out. With the flex, they've adjusted things with the new uh, LSAC president, Kelly Testy, who's great. They've 
been much more uh, better at communicating with students and they've been saying, two weeks from now, you'll get it. They actually stick to the date. That's very comforting for folks to not be frantically checking their LSAC accounts or their emails. And stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. Reflexively doing so. <laughs> yes, really, definitely. I mean, but with as they're changing things up a little bit, I think they're giving themselves a little bit of wiggle room, a little bit of a buffer because they also want to calibrate things a bit more with the longer testing sitting, the potentially higher volume of people might have some more work to do on their end. So they're saying maybe a little bit longer. I'm guessing three weeks at most, though. Also, law schools really want those scores. They want to get moving on applications. And LSAC really is an organization meant to serve law schools. And so if law schools want something and they're all in the same boat on that thing, I think LSAC is going to really work hard to deliver it. So I'd expect at the very least within like the first week of September. But I'm sure they'll be working around the clock to get them out. Right. Okay. Now, the undergrad world and parts of the graduate world have really been rocked um, as COVID accelerated or moved different programs to test optional or to issuing test waivers. I mean, on the undergraduate, I think we're now at 40% or 50% or something like that. Um, I understand that 60 of the top 100 MBA programs are now either test optional or issuing test waivers. There are a couple of medical schools that have gone test optional, which is kind of mind blowing. Um, do you think that might, and, and obviously some law schools have decided to accept the GRE. Do you see that happening in the law school world and why or why not? Well, there's, I think there's two questions here, right? Cause one is about, will they start taking the GRE as well? And then separately, right. will they go test optional entirely? So with regard to the GRE, I do expect that more and more law schools will take the GRE as a way to widen the applicant pool. I mean, they can, of course, evaluate folks on other criteria, like their GPAs, like their application essays and such, and they can choose very carefully whom they choose to admit with their GRE score as opposed to the standard, which is the LSAT. So I think that on a long enough timeline, virtually every law school will take the GRE as well, especially once Harvard start and make that big announcement, then many other schools followed suit shortly thereafter. Oh, yeah. If Harvard does it, then it must be okay, right? right. And they also <laughs> feel, they, I think they'd like to be able to widen the pool and take more applicants. That increases their selectivity, if nothing else. So of course, there's, I think there's a, a strong incentive to do it simply for competitive benefit over other law schools. So I think we'll certainly see every law school or most law schools take it eventually. Test optional is a different story, though, because in part, the American Bar Association requires schools to use a valid and reliable admission test. For, I think, most of the time that we've been around, it's been the LSAT is the main game in town, right? Right, GR is right. a fairly new uh, entrant. And is it valid or reliable? I mean, there's, that's debatable, but it seems to be that they're accepting that. There's, it's, right. no, no one's going to shut down a law school for doing the GRE instead. But test optional altogether, I think, is, is, is tough to sell. There, I've seen a couple of, uh, have you seen that? I think there was a school in Arizona that said that they considered the first semester of law school to be the best possible test for how you would do in law school. So in other words, they're not requiring transfer students to have the LSAT anymore? No, they were actually accepting students provisionally right. based on their performance during the first semester of 1L. And they said, well, Got if it. you can cut it that way, then we will take you for the remainder of the three years. Ooh, very. And no, I hadn't heard that. Yeah, I thought it was a very creative interpretation of valid and reliable admission tests. Yeah. And they, I mean, they got away with it from what I've seen. I didn't see anything saying that it wasn't going to work. Of course, this was with a very small number of students there. I think it might've been only for their own school's undergraduates. So it was like maybe like a, a pilot program or, or mini pipeline of mm -hmm. sorts. It wasn't mm -hmm. like they were opening this up to the entire world. Yeah. Yeah. I have my concerns about it though, because if you don't do well, then you just spent the first semester's tuition and have nothing to show for it if you don't get taken for the rest of it. Right. So I have some concerns regarding that, and I'm not sure that a lot, of, a lot of schools would go that route, but that could be one pathway to standardize test optional, but still technically falling within what the ABA requires under, again, what I consider a creative interpretation there. Again, I, I don't know how, obviously the ABA's uh, approval is critical. That's, that's the accrediting body. I know in the, in the business school world, several programs have, have started issuing test waivers. So basically what they say there is, 
you know, you, you fill out a form and you show that and without the GMAT or the GRE that you are qualified for, to, uh, that you're likely to do well in business school. Okay, based on your performance and, and college, based on your work performance, they have good confidence that you're going to perform academically. And then the school will issue a waiver and you don't need to take the GRE or the GMAT to get in. And uh, so that, that's kind of a middle, middle place between test required and test optional. No test required. Again, it's, it's a middle, middle spot. Um, and it's, again, from my perspective, seeing different graduate programs, it's really interesting to see how they're, they're all handling this because on one hand, uh, they want to increase access. They also want to stay competitively exclusive. So if they waive the test, you know, application volume soars. And if they don't, you know, students are happier, they don't have to, applicants are happier, they don't have to take the test. They don't have to spend money on the test. They don't have to spend money on prep. Um, and, uh, but it's going to be really interesting to see how this plays out. No, I, I really like that idea, actually, because there are a lot of students who, for whatever reason, they just don't do well in standardized tests. It could be nerves, it could be anxiety, it could be any one of a number of factors, but they've demonstrated their aptitude and their ability to succeed in law school based on some other factor. It could be work right. experience, it could be their GPA. And so if they can show, for example, that their, uh, their SAT or ACT performance did not accurately predict how they would do an undergrad and they killed an undergrad and got a great GPA, then why wouldn't we think they could do similar in law school as well? Right. The one concern right. I have, which I think is why the ABA requires this test, is, is bar passage rates. So if the bar exam exists and it's required to practice as an attorney, then we want to make sure you're going to do well on that. And the LSAT has some correlation with first year law school grades, which in turn can, can uh, translate into bar passage to some extent. But these aren't the strongest correlations in the world. So I could see why in many, many cases it wouldn't line up. And I actually think there's far too much emphasis placed on standardized tests in general. And to some extent, they're a necessary evil, but I'd love to see alternatives like what you laid out. Right. And I think that the law school you mentioned is going to say, look, if you if you think it's kind of putting your money where your mouth is uh, to the student. If you if you think you can do well in law school, show us and we'll admit you. Yeah, that's that's fair. I'm, I mean, at the same time, though, I still wonder about on the one hand, the law school gets that money. So they oh, have yeah. incentive to offer that program. And right. then secondly, I mean, the students, a lot of students desperately, desperately want to go to law school and then they're taking out big loans. And right. so I could see some of, some of these bottom of the barrel law schools, and I'm not going to name any names here, but there are mm -hmm. certain schools that I think don't have the students' best interests in mind as much as they have their tuition dollars in mind. <laughs> and they, 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 they need those students to, to um, make their overhead. Right. And some schools are in trouble. And so they're looking for to get dollars wherever they can get them. And right. that's where you have certain things like these Masters of Legal Studies degrees, for example, that I'm not sure are a good substitute for getting a JD. Right. No, clearly, clearly. Great points. Thank you. What are your top tips for people, people taking the LSAT remotely? I would say my biggest tip is to really simulate the testing environment as much as you possibly can. So... Making sure Talking about that practice exam, practice tests. Yes. So making sure you're taking your practice test in the same room, you'll take the actual thing, making sure your internet, internet connection is strong. And if not reaching out to LSAC about getting uh, an alternative place to take it, they'll give you a, 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 what's the word? They'll give you, they'll reimburse you if you want to take it at a hotel, for example, with a good internet. So I'd say wired internet if possible and making sure no one else is using it at the same time. So make sure it's strong enough because there's nothing more frustrating than getting kicked out in the middle of a timed exam setting on the real thing. So simulate, simulate, practice, practice, and um, make sure that you're used to the, the online LSAT format. So LSAC created Law Hub, aka official LSAT Prep Plus, where you can take the majority of LSATs with the same look and feel, the same style as you'll do an actual test day. And so don't do the majority of your studying in, in books when the exam has changed format completely. Makes sense. Great tips. Um, one question that occurred to me just now is, I mean, it does happen that there's a power outage or your internet goes down. You, you know, it's, somebody can do everything you said, right? They can do practice tests and then they're going to take the exam. <clears throat> they can work on a, on a wired 
internet connection. And still something will happen. What what happens then? What do they do? Yeah, that's, that's the worst thing because you could do everything right and then something happens from a totally outside external factor that just ruins it for that day. What you do is reach out to LSAC immediately, ask the proctor to make a note of it as well, if possible, depending on what happened. And then in some cases, LSAC will set up an alternative date in the short term. So maybe you could take it a week or two later. Alternatively, you might not be able to take until the next sitting, which is typically going to be a month later, maybe two. But that's really the, the best they can do for you, unfortunately, in most cases. And you know, they can't undo what happened already. And the power outage, of course, is, is out of their control. And hey, I mean, there are things that go wrong on Proctor UN's that Proctor U's end as well. And Proctor U, by the way, is the organization administering and proctoring the online LSAT. So there could be hap- things that happen that are at their fault as well. Either way, reach out to LSAC, reach out multiple times if necessary. Hopefully they'll make it right. They don't always get back to people quickly though, just because of the volume of people they're dealing with, but keep following up, keep calling, call first thing in the morning if you can, because that's the best chance of getting through to them without a long wait time. Okay, great advice. What would you have liked me to ask you that I haven't asked you about the return of the LSAT and the demise of LSAT Flex? I mean, honestly, Linda, I think you, you really covered everything. I, I love the questions. I think, we, I think we hit it from every angle. All right, great. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate your taking time to speak with me. Um, where can listeners and LSAT test takers learn more about your coaching service? Yeah, sure. So again, I'm Steve Schwartz. I run the LSAT blog and the LSAT Unplugged YouTube channel and podcast. I'm pretty easy to reach through all of these platforms. I've also got a free, easy LSAT cheat sheet. Folks can download at bit.ly slash LSAT cheat sheet, all lowercase, and that's the best way to get started. Okay, great. We're going to link in the show notes at accept.com slash 415 to the websites and resources that Steve just mentioned, as well as to other links to related articles and interviews, including previous interviews with Steve. Listener, thank you too for joining Steve Schwartz and me for our 415th episode. Quick reminder, grab your free copy of the Law School Admissions Guide, Eight Tips for Success. Accept its informative free guide for law school applicants at exhibit.com slash 415 download. And a final request, if you find the show worthwhile, please share the good word by leaving a review on iTunes. Your doing so helps us spread the good news about Admission Straight Talk. And you can leave the, uh, the review at lovethepodcast.com slash AST. And by the way, doing so will also enroll you in our lovethepodcast.com contest, okay? And and winners will receive a free consultation with me, 20-minute consultation. Thanks again for coming. This is Mission Straight Talk produced by Accepted, and I am your host, Linda Abraham. I'll talk to you again next week. Thanks for tuning into the show. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already to be notified of new episodes as I release them. And feel free to reach out if you need anything at all as you move forward with your prep. I'm happy to help however I can. In the meantime, I wish you all the best and take care.